started leading worship when I was in my early teens. Contemporary worship felt new and fresh to me and my church. And we learned how to lead from pioneering worship leaders that we saw at festivals, camps and conferences. I remember buying the newest CDs, learning the songs, watching carefully how those guys at the front of the festival stage were doing it. How about you? What have been your role models for worship leading? Are there worship leaders that you look up to? Perhaps for you, it's someone in your church, someone more experienced than you. Or maybe it's someone in the big church down the road who always does such a good job leading the congregation. You might have been to a Christian conference or festival, had a great time, really encountered God in the celebrations. And you've looked at the person at the front and thought about how you could be more like them. Well, I became a Christian at a summer festival, at a Christian festival, so straight away I was inspired by the ways that uh, they led worship that was different to how they did it at my home church. Yeah, I remember early days when I was maybe 10 or 11 going to Christian events with my family. Um, my dad was in the band and I just remember the guy with the guitar. And he was playing electric guitar actually, he's like amazing. Uh, he was a worship leader in our church at the time. This was before I'd even got behind the keys and done contemporary style worship. So um, he was somebody who modeled really good worship leading and then invited me to work with him and basically he trained me. It's great to have role models, great to have Christian leaders to look up to, great to learn from other people. After all, we hope that you will pick one or two things up from this video course. But when it comes to who you model yourself on as a worship leader, who you want to be like, we want to make a suggestion. How about being a worship leader like Jesus? How about when you sit at home preparing for Sunday, or when you write songs for your church, during rehearsal with your band, or when you're up there at the front of church, about to start the service or lead a time of singing? Could you ask yourself this question? How would Jesus lead worship? Now you might be thinking, but Jesus didn't play the guitar or the keyboard. He wouldn't have known the right microphone technique. In fact, there's very little reference of him even singing in the New Testament. It's once really after the Last Supper. That's it. So what can Jesus teach us about leading worship? When I was growing up in the 90s, everyone knew what WWJD meant. We wore it around our wrists, Christian bands sang about it and we earnestly asked each other at late night youth meetings, what would Jesus do? But you know, the questions were never about things like, should I eat fish or pork for dinner? Or should I mostly travel by foot or by donkey? The kinds of questions that we might actually see answered in Jesus' earthly life. No, they were very 1990s youth culture specific questions. Should I be dating non-Christians? How long is too long to spend playing on my PlayStation 1? Or should Christians go clubbing? We knew that those questions didn't have direct answers in Jesus' life. But as we sought to know Jesus better, we let his character and values spread into every part of our lives. So asking what would Jesus do made some strange sense. The same goes for leading worship. In the Bible, we don't see Jesus playing the organ or the guitar because he worshiped like the first century Jew that he was. We may need to shift our perspective a little to see that worship is so much more than just music and church services. It's true that Jesus sang, prayed and gathered with others to worship, but deeper than that, his whole life was dedicated to the obedient worship of God. He lived in close relationship with his father, empowered by the Holy Spirit to glorify God in everything he did. And that should be our role model for everything, including the ways we lead worship in church. So take a moment to pause this video and either reflect personally or discuss as a group around this question. What aspects of Jesus' life and character could inspire you as a worship leader or team? If we immerse ourselves in Jesus' values, his attitudes, his character, they can shape the kind of people and the kind of worship leaders we will be. We're gonna look at this in depth in the rest of this course. 
how Jesus' creativity, his humility and his reliance on the Holy Spirit and more can teach us how to be beautifully Christ-like worship leaders. But that's not all. How would Jesus lead worship goes deeper than that. Jesus actually is our worship leader. We might all fall into the trap sometimes of thinking the we, the people at the front of the church, the ones with their instruments and the microphones, that we are the ones to lead the church into the presence of God. The fact is that's not really within our powers as puny humans to engage people with God. We're genuinely not good enough. We're not worthy enough. None of us is, not even that worship leader that you watch on YouTube or the leader of the big church down the road. And no song, no prayer, no perfect liturgy or creative service can on its own merits bring people to God. This is not news. The whole story of God is about the loving father wanting a close relationship with his sons and daughters. But the fall and sinfulness of humanity causing a barrier to that love. This is the story we read from Genesis through to Revelation. In the beginning of the story, in the Old Testament, the holy God of Israel in his grace set up a system by which his children and unholy people could come to him. That was through the priest, the sacrifices and the temple. The priests were the worship leaders of the Old Testament. They were the ones who brought the people's offerings to God. God limited his presence among them to the most holy place in the temple. There, the presence of God was hidden behind a great curtain, keeping the sinful people from the holiness of God. The high priest could only come into the most holy place once a year with great ceremony, sacrifices and clouds of smoke to hide him from the consuming fire of God's presence. So if that was the case back then, something must have changed. How is it that we can come to worship God so freely today? Why don't we need animal sacrifices and a high priest to come into God's presence? Well, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament spells it out for us. It shows how Jesus himself is our great high priest and he is himself the once and for all sacrifice for our sin. It says that Jesus has fulfilled and exceeded all that the Old Testament worship system was pointing towards. It says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. We, unholy people, are invited to draw near, come into the most holy place, the presence of our Father God, and worship Him. How? Because of Jesus. Jesus makes the new and living way for us through the cross. What happened the moment when Jesus died? The curtain in the temple tore from top to bottom. The way to the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, was made open for us. Christ's death on the cross gives us access to the presence of God. But his work doesn't stop there. Hebrews 7 says this, Because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus continues to be our great high priest, our worship leader, who brings us into the presence of our Father by the Holy Spirit. And he takes our offerings of worship, however good or bad they might seem, he perfects them and offers them as worthy praise to God the Father. It's kind of like our efforts go through a Jesus filter and comes out good enough. We need to remember that it is God who invites us to come and worship him. And not only that, but that it's God who makes our worship possible and God who is the reason why we gather. God invites us like a couple might invite us to a wedding. In a way, we worship leaders are a bit like wedding planners. A wedding planner is hired by the bride and groom to help them plan their big day. They'll discuss, they'll collaborate, and the planner will take care of some of the practical stuff of organising and running the wedding. 
But the wedding planner is not doing their job well if they start to put the attention on themselves. They've missed the point if they think that they are the reason for the wedding or credit themselves for the success or failure of the marriage. Ultimately, the invitations come from the bride and groom. They pay for the wedding. They're the center of attention on the day and their love for one another is the engine room making the whole thing happen. In a similar way, Jesus is the one who pays the price for us to worship God. Our Father God should be the center of attention and the Holy Spirit is the engine room making our worship happen. God is the reason, the center and the means by which we worship and we are not God. So that should take the pressure off. It's not all about you and you don't have to get it all right before people will worship. Having said that, amazingly, God loves to partner with us when it comes to leading gathered worship. He graciously collaborates with us in our local church as we serve in planning and leading. He wants us to bring what we uniquely can bring, our music, our creativity, our ideas, our personality, and then he makes up for what is lacking. The best illustration I can think of for what this looks like is perhaps the story of the loaves and fish. Do you remember that story? We, like the small boy, bring what we have, our songs, our prayers, our efforts and music, uh, our leadership. We bring our creativity and our hearts and our unique character and perspective. And they may feel like a few loaves and small fish. We know that they're inadequate, but Jesus chooses to take our offerings, to bless it and break it and multiply it, to allow us to partner with him in feeding his people and glorifying his father. So this whole cause is really an invitation to partner with Jesus. He is the true worship leader and he invites you to work with him because well, he loves you and he likes working with you. And that should free us up to look deeper into this question as we look forward. How would Jesus lead worship? Let's bring this session to a close by praying together. Jesus, we're sorry for when we've made worship all about us. Help us to make you the true heart of worship. We bring you what is in our hands, thankful that you love to partner with us in leading your people. Amen.